For our second session of Covering Rare Diseases Day 2, we are extremely privileged to be joined by Fyodor Urnov. He is a professor of molecular therapeutics at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's also the scientific director at its institute or its Innovative Genomics Institute. Fyodor co-developed the toolbox of the human genome and epigenome editing, and also led the team that developed a strategy for genome editing in hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell disease, and beta thalassemia, which has yielded sustained clinical benefit for subjects in several ongoing clinical trials. I first met Fyodor Urunov while watching an online interview in which he discussed the concept of CRISPR on demand. In other words, researchers like Fyodor, who are on the leading edge of genetic research, are equally passionate about finding ways to make these advances available to more people around the world. Fyodor, thank you so much for joining us today. I <clears throat> pardon me, I sincerely appreciate the invitation. Um, it's a it's an important experience for me and for my institute uh, to connect with uh, journalists uh, who have who bring an essential global perspective to the important issue of providing um, solutions to the challenge of health justice in CRISPR. And that's what I'll speak to you uh, with you today about. So my plan is to spend maybe uh, half an hour telling you about um, CRISPR and genetic disease and give you sort of a November 14, 2023 status update on where we are as a field. Then I'll stop showing slides and uh, we'll just have a conversation because I mean, I'll, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest challenge that I see for my field in the next decade is how to distribute uh, uh, CRISPR cures equitably and justly, because uh, right now that system doesn't exist, but th this must change. And I think that coverage by global media of this essential issue will be a critical component uh, for success here. <clears throat> I also very nice to see Karen Weintraub. Uh, hi, Karen, uh, who has done some just really magnificent coverage of this issue for the media in the US. Um, and I just i am grateful to the world journalists for uh, paying attention. Okay, so I will go quickly. But I will send Rachel my slides. You can take my slides. There are multiple links to information. So don't worry. Don't worry if there's a bunch of things you don't follow. That that I'm just giving you a very high level overview, and then you can dig into things that are more interesting to you and your stories and your readership. Yeah. Health justice. What does that mean? Well, first my disclosures. Um Jennifer Doudna, who founded our institute, uh, says that we have a responsibility to pursue CRISPR's enormous potential to achieve previously impossible solutions to some of the world's big challenges, solutions that will be available to anyone. And that's going to be the focus of my talk today. Let me first describe to you a number of resources available to you beyond this presentation, if this is interesting. And I'll provide them in, in, in order of conceptual relevance. So if you are interested in the origin story of CRISPR, then I think the best thing to do is watch this documentary. It was nominated for an Emmy. It's available on Amazon. And I think it just does a spectacular job. Oops. It does a spectacular job explaining how CRISPR discovery and gene editing came about. It also has some wonderful perspective from the patient community in particular on sickle cell disease. This is David Sanchez, a delightful person with sickle cell disease who is in that film. If you need simple explanations for your readership of what CRISPR is, and if you need simple imagery for that, the Innovative Genomics Institute has invested in an entire resource. It's called CRISPRpedia. Again, you don't have to write this down. Rachel will have these slides. This was built for you. For you to go there to get simple, expert vetted explanations of CRISPR and 
imagery that you can use for your pieces as long as you credit with with completely free with as long as you credit the innovative genomics it's if you are interested in the current status of CRISPR gene editing trials, again, the Innovative Genomics Institute has invested in detailed expert vetted coverage of this issue. Um, and this is the webpage where you can find this. I will speak to a bunch of this, but I'm just giving, making you aware of the fact that this resource exists. If you are interested in the core challenge that I will speak with you about, then I read an, a piece in the, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this. I believe it is behind a firewall, paywall. But if you need access to it, let me know and I will send you a link. And um, I will. I wrote in this piece uh, about what it means to build a world with CRISPR for all. I also gave a TEDx talk. Um, it's, I think, about 15 minutes long. And if you wanted a really short version of everything I'm about to say, then I think this 15 minute talk is probably a fairly reasonable resource for you to look at. Finally, um, if you're interested in the issue of healthcare economics, like how, who is going to pay for this and how, um, the IGI yet again has invested in, in a formidable way here. My colleagues, Melinda Kliedman and Manar Zagula, led a large task force devoted to how are we going to make this affordable. You can download the full report. It's written in very accessible language that showcases both the challenge and what we need to do. So those are the resources. Again, Rachel will have the slides with all the hyperlinks. So the promise of genome editing is computer-like, word processor-like control over human DNA. And we represented this a long time ago with this keyboard where instead of the normal letters of the English alphabet, we have just the four letters of, the, of human DNA. I want to very, very strongly and upfront apologize and acknowledge the egregious bias towards uh, diseases and healthcare narratives that are focused on um, sort of middle to upper income countries. And this is a, a serious failing of healthcare broadly, of biomedicine, of education. And I'm very mindful of this, and the IGI is working actively to address this. Just to be very clear, these are the causes of death, according to the World Health Organization, in uh, upper middle income countries. And this is the, this is, but critically, if you look at um, lower income countries, uh, the, the ranking of conditions is very, very different. So I just want to be very clear. This is unacceptable. The IGI is working towards this. Uh, uh, near the, nearly the entirety of clinical development of CRISPR is happening in the United States. New Zealand um, and Europe. Uh, our central goal is to change that. But I just want to be very clear and upfront state to you in the strongest possible terms that I'm not oblivious to the fact that, you know, I'm I'm a professor in California and the the, the immediate focus over the work is the world around us. But we are very mindful of the fact that we live in a much, much larger world which has needs that our current effort doesn't address. So I just want, I want to be clear that you folks hear this from me. So there is a lot of text here. Don't worry about this. I will simply explain to you in the next five minutes, what can genome editing do for human health for starters? And then I will transition to the bigger picture. The most immediate impact of genome editing is on what's so-called Mendelian genetic disease of which sickle cell disease is the most important example where if you have one change in one gene, you will get a disease with a very high likelihood. There is a resource available to you. It is curated by human beings. It's called the Online Mendelian Inheritance mm -hmm. Advance. And uh, the, way, the way the resource works is you can, I'm sorry, there, there, there's a bit of sound in the background. If somebody, if folks could mute their microphones, I think that could be great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so, this is a free resource. And what's really important about it is it's curated by human beings. It has a catalog of 6,000 such genetic diseases that affect 350 million people worldwide. So you can search this database both for a given disease and that you will get a lot of information and for genes. So you have two complementary perspectives. So what does the disease look like and what does the gene look like mutations and which cause the disease? 
Next, there are diseases where there is a specific variant in a given gene that predisposes to disease. So a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 gives a woman carrier somewhere between a 70%, about a 70% chance of getting ovarian or breast cancer. And it's terrible. The current uh, standard of care, tragically, is a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy or forectomy. This will be a difficult problem to crack genome editing. I don't want to sugarcoat this. Um, not because we don't want to fix this, but because it's technically very hard. <clears throat> but I will focus on one example where we think that genome editing can make a difference. This is the risk of Alzheimer's disease, which is rapidly growing in public health impact. There are obviously 8 million Americans with this disease who have really no disease-modifying treatments. So the, the poster human being for this issue is Chris Hemsworth, the actor. And you know him from, I think, Marvel movies. But um, he has gone public with the realization that he carries a strong risk variant for Alzheimer's disease. And in very practical terms, if he lives to 70, he will have about an 80% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. And nothing we currently know can change that unless we can gene edit him. So he's in his mid-30s. So we have about 30 years to help him. And so what's the story here? So the story here is there's a specific gene called APOE, and it comes in th three flavors, flavor number two, flavor number three, and flavor number four. People who have two copies of the APOE2 form are actually protected from Alzheimer's. People like Chris Hemsworth, who have two forms of APOE4, have a much higher risk of Alzheimer's dementia. We know what the mutation is, and the major goal for our effort moving forward is figure out how to gene repair the brain. That's what this is going to take. And many people are working on this. So what I just did is I made a transition from a genetic disease where the variant is certain to cause it, sickle cell disease, to a genetics-driven disease where there's a higher likelihood. <clears throat> that the, the biggest impact um, of genetics on human disease is in neither category. It's in these so-called complex diseases, uh, such as heart disease, such as uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's, for example where there are gene variants at many positions in the DNA, and they together drive the risk of disease. So for example, about 250 gene variants drive risk of inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. About 100 different gene variants drive a measurable fraction of genetic risk of cardiovascular disease. So what can gene editing do here? Well, so let me let me first give you a, a quick explanation of how this works technically to explain the challenge. So um, if you have access to chat GPT, um, and if you type explain to me a genome-wide association study, this is, a, this is what I will say, and I'm a professor of this field. I read this, and this is a really good explanation. Um, I don't want to spend time reading except to say that the basic idea is you take many, many thousands of people with and without the condition, and you read their DNA and you compare the DNA. There's a lot more to it, putting it very mildly, but the bottom line is this technique allows you to identify such genetic changes. I think this is important for you because there are some really impactful healthcare examples where this worked to change care of disease. So these are genetic data for one, two, three, four, four different human conditions that are not quote-unquote genetic in a simplistic way, but where genes make a contribution. And the, the, this is listed by chromosome, from chromosome 1 through chromosome X. So the biggest genetic risk for cardiovascular disease is on chromosome 9. Um, you know, the, the biggest uh, genetic risk for uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis is on chromosome 6. But for Crohn's disease, which is a type of inflammatory bowel disease, there are many such risk genes. And one of them shown here was discovered as part of an effort like this. And when scientists discovered this gene as being involved in the disease, um, then uh, scientists and physician scientists developed a medicine. It's a biologic, it's an antibody that you inject. It's called Stellara. And it works really well. And it uh, has a, a, given its manufacturer, which I believe is Johnson & Johnson, a $10 billion in revenue in 2022. So I'm telling you this to say that you can use this approach to find genes, variants in which make you susceptible to disease. And critically, and that's the most important part, you can use that genetic clue to develop a medicine that will work. 
So the big challenge for the gene editing field is how do we take data from all of these kinds of um, studies on human beings and thousands of such studies have been done and make them actionable from a gene editing perspective. So I will describe to you some examples of what's currently happening. So for the first flavor of disease where you have one gene, one mutation, clear disease, our field has made major progress for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, which are together the two most prevalent genetic diseases on earth. Then I will describe to you where we are with that. Um, there are um, diseases such as Alzheimer's where a specific variant predisposes. So uh, for neurodegenerative disease risk, I think we're three to five years away from a clinical trial for, the, for this. Um, remarkably, the last category, which is cardiovascular disease, which I explained to you is a complex condition, has recently uh, been the focus of gene editors. And in fact, a clinical trial was just described two days ago where the first 10 subjects were dosed for, with gene editing for cardiovascular disease. So scientifically and clinically, really good progress. And as I'm, I'm going to get to in about 15 minutes, that really raises the volume on the challenge of getting to a, a, a treatment that is equitable and just. Mm -hmm. So this is my introduction to the landscape of genetic disease and what gene editing could do. I need to now explain to you how gene editing works. I think it's important because it's a, it's a technology that has a lot of misunderstanding about it. And the very first thing I wanted to say to you, and I want to be as abundantly clear as I can, 100% of what I'm going to say has to do with editing existing people with existing disease, children or adults. 0% of what I'm discussing is so-called embryo editing or germline engineering for reproductive purposes. There is an astonishing amount of misinformation about this. And I can summarize you for you the truth about this germline editing in one sentence. It has zero ethically justifiable medical use, zero. And all people who state otherwise simply don't know what they're talking about. In the next decade, human embryo editing for reproductive purposes will have zero impact, zero on public health. Instead, it'll just be the topic of a lot of poorly informed public debate. 100% of the focus of our field, not 99.3%, 100% should be on one issue and one issue only. How do we treat and potentially prevent existing disease in existing human beings? That is 100% where our biggest area of impact lies. Okay? If you want to talk about this, I'm happy to. But it, it is, to me, if there is one topic where I, I wish there were more clarity in the media, is this one. Um, and there isn't, unfortunately. And I'm not blaming anyone in particular. It's just, it's just, it's an issue that has confused people. Okay, so I will speak with you about the basic science of gene editing. The keyboard you saw earlier and this beautiful little picture is actually an atomic picture of a gene editor. And this gene editor is called CRISPR. And it was, uh, the, the way it works was discovered here at UC Berkeley by Jennifer Doudna. This is her receiving the Nobel Prize. Uh, she shared it with Emmanuel Charpentier. And I will explain to you very briefly how, how CRISPR works to do gene editing. <clears throat> Our human genome is very long. Um, if you read one letter of the DNA at a second, A, G, A, G, T, C, etc., it'll take you one century, one century to read the entire human DNA. So this is a tiny fraction of it. And this is an even smaller one. This is the 12 base pairs of uh, double helical DNA, which Watson and Crick proposed based on data from Rosalind Franklin and others. Human DNA is highly resistant to targeted change. It does not want to be changed. So if there is a mutation, Human cells do not want it repaired. Human DNA experiences damage, whether you're exposed to sunlight, tobacco smoke, um, a chest X-ray, your DNA will be damaged. And there are incredibly robust repair pathways that fix all this damage. And we know how robust they are because people with genetic mutations in these pathways suffer terrible disease. We are largely oblivious to this because they just work. The most important pathway for gene editors today is repair of double strand breaks. So um, these breaks occur spontaneously, just the chromosome breaks. Um, when you get exposed to x-rays for medical purposes, 
or flying on a plane, you get exposed to, exposed to radiation. Your DNA will break. And Mother Nature is very concerned about this. So there are two separate ways to put the DNA back together again. The first way is to stick the two pieces of DNA together like this. And the second way is to uh, repair the break using information from a related piece of DNA, so another chromosome. So this is the fundamental biology of how our cells deal with breaks. For genome editing, what we have done is we have invented ways to create such a break on demand on in a gene of interest that causes disease. And how does that lead to gene editing? So for, oops, sorry. So for the first pathway, if you create a break, if you do this right, Mother Nature will make a, make a mistake and you will gain or lose a few letters of DNA and that will lead to a gene function being stopped. <clears throat> and this is being used clinically. And I will explain how. You can also provide a repair template and Mother Nature will transfer information from that repair template that you've just given to the cell or the organ into the broken chromosome. So you can add a gene, and this is currently about to be used clinically, and I will explain how. So all of this is good, but it's not clear how you do this thing. How do you make a break in one gene when I just told you that the human genome takes a century to read? That's an enormous bit of text. So this is where CRISPR comes in. And obviously, this is the Nobel Prize winning paper from Jennifer and Emmanuel. So I will briefly tell you uh, what CRISPR is about. Uh, and please recall the, 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 the resources I recommended at the beginning. There's an entire movie about how this was discovered. The IGI provides a large amount of resources about the underlying science. So please do not let my two-minute explanation uh, confuse you because there's a lot of resources for you to work your way through this. In Mother Nature, and this was Jennifer's discovery, the way CRISPR works is it protects bacteria from being attacked by other parasites. So it's a two-component system. There's a protein called Cas9, which carries an RNA, which is like a little most wanted poster that a law enforcement official carries. And Cas9 carries this little snippet of nucleic acid, and it surveys the cell for incoming DNA. And if that DNA is a match, then the cell knows that it is being attacked, and Cas9 cuts it. So um, for genome editing, you repurpose Cas9, you bring it into human cells, and you arm it with a piece with a nucleic acid that you have designed to recognize a, a mutant gene to fix to fix to fix the DNA. So I'll just very briefly tell you about the underlying biology because it's beautiful. So that this is a, a high resolution structure of this amazing enzyme. So you're looking at a lot of very pretty ribbons. But just for you to understand, the DNA here is in uh, black and in blue. The RNA that Cas9 carries is in orange. And everything else is the protein itself. But the way this beautiful large protein docks onto its DNA target is by taking the orange RNA that it carries and pairing up with the DNA target using rules A equals T, C equals G, that are very simple. And when this pairing occurs, Cas9 cuts the DNA, so it breaks the DNA apart. So the Nobel Prize winning discovery by Jennifer is the realization that you can uh, change where Cas9 cuts. You can give it a stretch of nucleic acid that matches your gene of interest, and it will cut there on demand. And so I have a quick animation for you to show what that looks like. So... You start by taking Cas9 and you're giving it a little location code to recognize a target gene, to create a break. Here's a very simple schematic. Here's a gene and here's a position that you need fixed. What do you do? You identify 20 nucleotides, 20 consecutive letters in that gene. And then you take Cas9, the protein, and you give it a nucleic acid, which has a match to that region. It's that it's literally that simple. And when you give this to Cas9, Cas9 has evolved, as I just showed you, to recognize this DNA and then create a break. And when that break is repaired, as I mentioned a few slides ago, you can either get rid of genes or repair genes. 
That's the basic idea. And the reason people are very excited about this is you can program Cas9 to recognize gene number one for disease number one or gene number seven for disease number seven using these very simple rules. We have never had a medicine that this is this conceptually simple. So Jennifer Doudna closed her paper by describing this system as having considerable potential. And it's been quite remarkable since they, uh, Emmanuel and Jennifer published this work what an incredible rise there has been in um, the adoption of CRISPR into the clinic. So it's a very rapidly, very rapidly growing field. And um, the most exciting thing for all of us gene editors is the basic idea that you can take the same system and change a tiny bit and get different medicines has become clinical reality. So I'll show you some data on the treatment of sickle cell disease. Um, where Cas9 was programmed to repair that disease. And I'll mention some data on a degenerative disease work. The same Cas9, the protein is the same, but the little snippet of 20 nucleotides that routes it to a different gene um, is different. And you've gotten a different medicine for a different disease. So um, you have a colleague, uh, Rob Stein of NPR and National Public Radio in the United States. And uh, for three years now, he has been doing some absolutely exemplary reporting on this issue. So if you are interested in the human narrative of what, it what it's like to be gene edited and why, I think Rob Stein's reporting uh, on this has been really exemplary. Um, Gina Kalata in the New York Times, again, Karen Weitraub, um, uh, um, Emily Mullen uh, have been doing some really stellar reporting. So if you want... If you want a list of, of uh, journalists in US media that have done that, I think just an exemplary job writing writing about this, uh, Carolyn Johnson, um, I'm very happy to send you the list. There's some really stellar stellar people write, write, writing about um, gene editing in the clinical space, but I think Rob's reporting is a really good start. Okay, so let me tell you um, what editing actually physically looks like. So um, let's talk about editing for sickle cell disease. Point mutation causes devastating disease. Um, more than 100,000 Americans have it. Um, the public health impact globally is incredibly large. Tens of millions of people there, I believe, you know, the life expectancy of, 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 a, of a human being with sickle cell disease in certain parts of Africa is five. In America, it's about 40, so it's, it's terrible. Um, the public health burden of sickle is enormous, and I really like this representation, which showcases the fact that you know we here in the United States think a lot about the United States, but the real the real parts of the world where these diseases make an impact is not here. It's it's in it's in Africa and and, and you know Southeast Asia. So the, the way sickle cell disease is currently treated, and don't get lost in the molecular details too much is by getting a spare tire out of the trunk of our molecular car. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> our hemoglobin, which makes our cells, red blood cells red, um, consists of two parts, an alpha and a beta. Um, when you are a fetus, you make a different hemoglobin. It's a perfectly normal hemoglobin called fetal. And the central idea for treating sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia is actually not to repair the mutation, which happens here but to wake up this fetal hemoglobin. And what do I mean by that? So if you look at this graph, um, after you are born, mother nature silences expression of fetal hemoglobin and then wakes up the adult hemoglobin, which normally nobody notices. We just go about our lives. <clears throat> but if you have sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia, then your beta globin gene is mutant. So mother nature inactivates a normal gene, fetal hemoglobin, not knowing that she's about to create sickle cell disease or beta thal. So uh, this is clinically treated by um, taking Cas9 and arming it to get rid of a gene that drives this switch. And so when you get rid of this gene, this switch never happens. Fetal globin just stays on and beta globin largely doesn't turn on. <clears throat> and so the way this is technically done, and this is important, is you take a human being and you bring them into a hospital and you treat them with expensive medicines to get their blood stem cells in a bag, literally, there's a bag. 
the cells are then shipped to a central manufacturing location and with an expensive facility it takes millions of dollars to build and millions of dollars to maintain so this is not just a room it's an extremely sophisticated room and then the stem cells are gene edited using sophisticated equipment so to be clear they're gene edited in a dish and then they are sent back to the hospital and then the human being comes back and they get chemotherapy and they get chemotherapy to get rid of bad stem cells and make room for the good ones and um, this is this is a serious medical procedure because the person becomes immunodeficient for at least a month and so they need to be kept in a hospital under highly specialized care you then give them the cells back and the edited cells go back into their bone marrow and uh, if everything goes to plan these individuals then have uh, healthy stem cells to make healthy red blood cells so rob stein has reported extensively on this incredibly brave human being victoria gray she was the first person to receive this treatment for sickle cell disease and um, her courage is extraordinary and our field owes an enormous debt of gratitude to her for having volunteered to be um, a patient on this clinical trial but here she is getting chemo um, so this is a difficult procedure she describes this very eloquently and um, a year after treatment uh, her major symptoms which is pain and the need for medication to manage the pain and blood transfusions has gotten a lot better and so this was incredibly exciting to us and this is her in london visiting the british museum uh, earlier this year I actually had the incredible honor of meeting her um, this has gone really well so that the sponsor of this the developer of this medicine vertex pharmaceuticals has recently described data where they treated 32 individuals with this approach and um, the, these individuals have largely experienced a resolution of their major symptoms so they have no pain episodes and they don't need transfusions so uh, uh, based on this progress um, uh, the food and drug administration uh, convened uh, on uh, at the end of october just just very recently a large gathering that discussed the pros and cons of this approach and you there's there was a lot of coverage in the media on this i'm just using gina Colata's piece you can watch this entire proceeding and um the the one thing i can say is um the advisory committee to the fda um uh, raised some issues with respect to safety but um, the food and drug administration is expected to opine on whether or not this should be an approved medicine on December 8. And if they say yes, then this medicine will be approved for prescription in the United States. Um, gene editing is being developed into new approaches. And one of them does not involve a double strand break. It involves specifically changing a single letter of human DNA on demand. And uh, two areas of interest for this technology, um, this is sort of genome editing 2.0, are cancer and heart disease. Let me explain to you the cancer story. So there is an enormous amount of information here. And what it basically comes down to is you can take human immune cells and weaponize them to attack that person's cancer. So the mechanics are you take a person with cancer, you take out their immune system cells, you use gene editing to weaponize them against the cancer, and you put them back in. And this was extensively described in the medical literature and the popular press. But um, most importantly, there's a child who has been saved from their disease. Um, and uh, global coverage, I, I imagine some of you reading this probably wrote some of these pieces. Um, and there was an enormous amount of uh, global coverage about this. Um, <clears throat> you know, to be very, very clear, uh, cancer is an enormous public health burden worldwide. We're talking about single digit human beings, but this clearly takes an important first step on the path to using gene editing to treat cancer. Um, I will now speak with you about gene editing where you inject CRISPR into the body. Everything I've discussed so far involves taking a human, taking the cells out, gene editing and putting them back in. So gene editing in vivo where you CRISPR is in a syringe has made important progress and um, this is a nice story, I think, by um, Emily Mullen. I hope I have this right. Um, uh, at Wired, um, where she um, describes how a community in Northern Ireland um, and uh, the Republic of Ireland has been affected for historical reasons with a genetic disease that is really 
severe and leads to um, gradual degeneration of the function of the muscle, skeletal muscle, the heart, the nerves. And so the way this is technically done to treat this disease is you inject a CRISPR embedded in a lipid nanoparticle. So technology that is familiar to you where you um, you know use LNPs to do SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Here, instead of putting in um, a SARS-CoV-2 encoding uh, antigen encoding mRNA, you use um, um, CRISPR. And so the CRISPR routes to the liver and gets rid of the toxic gene. And uh, the, the single most important lesson from everything I'm about to say is that it's um, really been a proof that you can make a different medicine for a new disease by changing the guide RNA. And it's working amazingly well. So Intelia Therapeutics, which is a US company, has shown that you can basically gene edit the entire human liver, which is a large organ, right? The liver is about 1.4 liters. So you get 93% editing in the entire human liver out of one administration of a teaspoon of CRISPR, which is kind of astonishing. So this is for this degenerative disease. <clears throat> and then they kept everything the same, the lipid nanoparticle, the CRISPR, except they changed that 20 nucleotide stretch to target a different gene for a different disease, and they got a different medicine. And most importantly, they're about to start a 700-person strong clinical trial in the United States. So that will, that means that in you know about three years, there will be about a thousand people have been gene edited. It's a, it's a really landmark moment. And again, to be clear, this is a vivo CRISPR injection. And so in closing of this technical part, um, the most recent news is gene editing for cardiovascular disease. And this all began uh, with the discovery of rare human beings. Most of them are of African ancestry. So this is a really one of the many important examples where um, uh, studies of genetics of disease um, in, in Africa and on the African continent has really given us a critical clue as to how to treat disease more broadly. Um, and what was discovered is some individuals of African descent have very low risk of heart, um, uh, cardiovascular disease. And it had to do with the fact that they have a natural genetic variant in a gene called PCSK9. And if they have those variants, they're nearly 90%. They have a 90% reduction in the cardiovascular disease risk, which is kind of astonishing. And so um, the biotechnology company Verve has taken the approach I just described, which is you use a lipid nanoparticle to take CRISPR into the body, except getting rid of this gene for um, degenerative disease. They get rid of this gene where natural variants are known to protect against heart disease. And they've just announced uh, um, three weeks ago that they are going to do the trial in the US. But uh, Sunday, uh, again, a lot of coverage in the media, yet again, I'm using um, a Gina Colata's piece. <clears throat> they've described treating 10 individuals in New Zealand uh, with genetic cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's been just really impressive uh, um, how well it's worked. Uh, to all of us who work on this, it's been particularly exciting because Lilly, which is obviously a giant uh, pharmaceutical company riding on some tremendous su successes in terms of developing medicines for obesity and uh, cardiovascular disease, Lilly has partnered with this company to take this uh, medicine um, forward through clinical trials. So <clears throat> this is an example where gene editing has taken a step into cardiovascular disease, uh, which has complex genetics, and yet here we are. Okay. So as promised, I'm, I'm done uh, with my technical introduction. And as we transition to um, no slides and more of a Q&A session uh, and going back to my piece in the New York Times, why are we worried that CRISPR will not be distributed equitably and justly? Why do we argue that we have to change things to build a world with CRISPR for all? Well, I'll just give you something very specific. So this is a very important human being and also a wonderful human being. This is Dr. Peter Marks. He's the most important regulatory official in the world, as far as gene editing is concerned. He heads the branch of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US that controls gene editing. And he also controls gene therapies, which is the sort of the, the older sibling to gene editing, where you take a gene put in into a virus and you put the, put the cells back in or put the virus into a person. And the, you know, three weeks ago, he gave a talk and I took a photograph of these are the approved gene editing gene therapy medicines, not gene editing. So the, the blue ones are for cancer. 
and um, this medicine and this medicine is a virus which you di direct directly um, administer to the human body, as are these, and these are where you fix the stem cells and you put them in. So this is exciting, but th this is the truth. Their price points are prohibited. So the most recent medicines are between 2.9 to 3.2 million dollars a patient. As Jennifer Dowden said very eloquently, a three million dollar cure is not really a cure. And I'll close my slide section. And I, I looked at the list of lineup. I know some of you folks represent Brazil, which obviously is a, a magnificent country with a large population, um, but um, a less than well developed gene therapy infrastructure. And I was just really affected by the following exchange on Twitter. Um, with a person from Brazil. So I posted how excited I am for Gene Bennett, who is this amazing physician who developed a medicine for congenital blindness called Luxterna, which is $850,000, which is not something Dr. Bennett had anything to do with. This was to do with a company that commercialized it. And I get this note on Twitter, and I have a colleague who's from Brazil. So I had them translate this for me. And this person writes, I have two children, and both of them are going blind and um, they need Luxterna, but the healthcare authorities and PEs um, have rejected my request to pay for this medication, uh, even though it's approved for use in the United States because we can't afford this much money. And so can you please help me? So I obviously did what I could, which is not much, um, but to me, you know, this really emphasizes the the giant gap between all of these incredibly exciting healthcare advances in the States and in, in, in the United Kingdom and Italy and New Zealand and what's happening in the rest of the world. And just closing my technical side, um, the, the, there are three major issues. The first issue is that um, in the United States, you can price these medicines through the roof. So, you know, physicians, uh, a company that sponsors, uh, that sells a gene editing medicine like Novartis for spina muscular atrophy, gene therapy, they charge $2 million for it. And they, in the United States, they can get that, that money reimbursed. Mm -hmm. Even in Europe, which has reasonable healthcare resources, that doesn't fly. So the European regulators say, well, it's too expensive. We're not gonna, we're not gonna let you charge this much. And some companies accept the price reduction, but some companies just leave the market. So there is a U.S. biotech called Bluebird, and they developed a medicine for uh, um, a genetic condition called beta thalassemia, and they wanted two million. The Europeans said, "How about seven hundred thousand? And Bluebird said, "No one left the market." So the pricing for these is ridiculous. Number two, the infrastructure to develop these doesn't really exist in the parts of the world where there is major unmet need. So we work with Brazilians to develop therapies for uh, sickle cell disease. And I know that in Bahia, where there is a formidable public health burden of sickle cell disease, uh, it's, a, it's a province in Brazil. You know, there's a lot of folks in it, but their social economic, socioeconomic status is lower than the rest of the population. And I just explained to you that to make this sickle medicine, you need a specialized hospital, you need a specialized facility, you need all of this stuff. And that doesn't really exist, nor does it exist in Africa, where, you know, there are, the public health burden is enormous. And for beta thalassemia, which is incredibly prevalent in Vietnam, in Thailand, um, in parts of India, again, the infrastructure doesn't exist. So just these medicines cannot be delivered there. And last, uh, you know, most of the world's genetic diseases are not currently the focus of uh, biotech companies or pharma because they just don't see how, we, how they're going to make a profit on a rare disease. So wrapping up and opening the floor to your questions, and I see some hands raised, the central goal of CRISPR and us in academia and nonprofit is really build a nonprofit path. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, that means focusing on diseases that are neglected. Number two is thinking ahead to how we're going to develop this, deploy this in the developing world and more equitably and justly in the United States. And that means building new technologies and also building new regulatory pathways. And number three is really reducing this to practice, namely where we approach um, regulatory authorities in the United States 
in Europe, in, in South America, in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia, uh, and say to them, look, we, we want to work with you to develop uh, accelerated regulatory paths for affordable CRISPR. So a bunch of hands are raised. I'll just start in order of the route. Camila, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Camila from Brazil. So you talked about uh, this kind of um, millions of dollars to uh, cure one child or two in your Twitter. This is a question here, uh, but uh, you talked about a lot uh, sickle cell disease. Here in Brazil, we have lots of uh, crowdfunding, fundraising from families who uh, children has uh, SME, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. And then the most expensive drug on the the country, like six million dollars to uh, the treatment. So we have a public health system, like you said. So it's a big dilemma here. My story, we write about these polemics uh, in order to you take the this amount of money to cure one kid, and all others uh, public health system they start talking. Wow, rare diseases, and uh, it's a very a uh, sensitive uh, subject. I want to hear your opinion about it because you you brought the discussion from Twitter. Yeah, um, South Global. We we always have this, this kind of dilemma. There is not enough enough money to cure all of them. So listen, especially I, well, on, about childhood. Yeah, my my story will focus on childhood. So. Uh, I would love to. I would love to read your story and uh, just share it on Twitter and internally. What you are describing is an outrage. This is unacceptable. We cannot have a situation where the health authorities have to choose to save one human being and then take funding away from tens of thousands of others for basic healthcare needs. And so. The path to this is twofold. First, we have to understand, with all respect to pharmaceutical companies, they are not in the business of providing healthcare solutions to the entire world. They're in the business of providing healthcare solutions in parts of the world where they can get um, revenue. So I don't really see how the current generation of gene therapy medicines, including for spina muscular atrophy, can become meaningfully scaled to the to the planet. We really need novel technologies such as CRISPR, which can be manufactured more affordably. And we need uh, nonprofit governmental partnerships to build these medicines for these diseases and distribute them cost affordably. Again, I'm, I'm not arguing against capitalism. It's a system that works. But I really see the problem that you're describing as not having a solution under the current market system. So there is not a future where suddenly pharmaceutical companies say, wow, you know what? We're very sorry for these children in Brazil or, you know, uh, Thailand. We're going to charge $2 million for this medicine in the United States and 20000 in Brazil or Thailand or, you know, Nigeria. That's not happening. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So the nonprofit government partnerships to develop um, solutions that are scaled technologically and financially configured to be compatible with the health challenges is the only way forward. Now, the unfortunate thing is that these will take several years to develop. And that's really sad for spina muscular atrophy. Again, I mean, your readership will know this. The sooner you treat a child with spinal muscular atrophy, the better, because, you know, they get worse over time. And if you don't treat them early, they will be disabled for life. So it's not like we're sitting here going, wow, we're going to take 10 years to fix this. No, we're working aggressively. But <clears throat> unfortunately, the, the, the best news I can, I can offer is uh, the way out of this dilemma, which again, I deeply, deeply relate, is to build different medicines distributed in different ways. Uh, Julia. Hi, Julia. I'm also in San Francisco. 
around the Bay Area. What question I have is I have a rare disease. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a gene found for it. It's I have a type of vasculitis. I guess there is a chance it is, especially with some ethnicities having a greater chance of um, getting it and also a greater likelihood in families. But the question I'm wondering is, is there continuing to be an effort in addition to developing these therapies to try and define um, certain genes for conditions, um, which you can't even get the ball rolling yet for gene therapies if you don't find the genes yet? Um. It is relatively rare that the same technology can be used as a medicine yeah. and to discover the cause of a disease. And remarkably, CRISPR is that. Okay. So the way this technically works is you take a human being with a condition that is suspected to be genetic because of family history or other features, and you read their DNA. This is quite affordable. You know, you can do that for $2,000 in under a week. The challenge now becomes to find of all the genetic changes this person has, and an average person has 6,000 genetic differences in proteins relative to any other person. And if you're of African ancestry, Africa is the greatest hot, greatest space for human genetic diversity on earth. If you're of African ancestry, that number goes much, much higher. But now what do we do with this? And so we can use CRISPR to figure out which of these genetic changes is the likeliest culprit. And that then nominates that gene as a target for therapy. So this has been done. The problem is, so technically this is addressable, is who's going to pay for this? Like we're talking about months of work by dedicated researchers. Again, I know I just, uh, in, in, in speaking with a journalist from Brazil, with Camilla, I more or less said the same thing. We, we basically need to realize that for the first time in history, we have the technologies to support families and individuals such as yourself who bring um, the promise of CRISPR into sharp focus, we can find the genetic cause and we can potentially treat it. But there's not the infrastructure to do that scalably, where, you know, families tell me of their journeys where they go from hospital to hospital, from doctor to doctor, trying to find someone to help them. This is another example where the healthcare system has not really caught up with the technology. Yet again, a major goal for us and many nonprofits and academics in this space is to build scalable solutions. Again, the technologies exist. We need ways to incorporate them into the healthcare process. I think the part of the world where I think we have the best chance is the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom has a program where they sequence large numbers of people, including newborns, and that's free. The, the National Health Service pays for this. They're also making a lot of investment in uh, ways to understand what the variants are that cause disease and also connecting it to CRISPR cures. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in this, which I think is a really uh, Genomics England, so the entity in the United Kingdom that focuses on this is called Genomics England, and they're good to look up. All right. Uh, oops, I, I'm, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. Yes, it's Rupsha. Uh, so I'm from... India and we have a huge burden of sickle cell anemia, right? So as Cam uh, Camellia has already outlined, there is a huge issue of affording the medicines or uh, sorry, the, the therapy in, in across the world, especially in developing country like India. So I just have a very basic question. So considering we have come a long way in gene therapy, like uh, if, even if you talk about CAR T uh, cell gene therapy and all, but still why this therapy are not covered any medical health insurance mm -hmm. like as some talks are being initiated to involve those therapies under the health insurance and if yes what are the responses of the uh, insurance companies why they avoid including this kind of new therapy which has proven its efficiency why we are still lagging behind uh, globally actually Oh my goodness, you are really touching an issue that's very close to my heart because um, here we are at UC Berkeley in California developing these CRISPR solutions, thinking we're going to save the world. And the reality hits in exactly what you just said, Rupert. Right? It's not that you have a technology that fixes a disease. It's who's going to pay for this. I'm not a specialist in healthcare economics, but I've spoken with a lot of people who are. The pricing of this 
is the key issue. If you have something priced at $2 million to $3 million, insurance companies in many parts of the world are just not configured to tolerate that kind of cost. You probably are aware of the fact that India, in fact, has become the world leader is in an important movement of building affordable cell therapy solutions. And a really important example is an Indian company founded by Sid Mukherjee, who is actually an American yes, physician yes. scientist uh, of Indian ancestry. And he has co-founded a company called Immuneal, I-M-M-U-N-E-E-L. I had they... interviewed him last year. Oh, well, then you know the story. And so the story, folks, for those who don't know, he's making a medicine which in the United States is $475,000. 475000 In India, that company can make that cell therapy product for 16000 And so they've in innovated on the technology side. They've innovated on the supply chain side where the materials are cheaper. And what that basically shows is if you build a medicine with an explicit focus on scalability and affordability, then you can lower the cost from half a million to 16,000. But, you know, India, the public, India is what, 1.4 billion people. It's a, an enormous community. And obviously the public health burden of cancer is enormous. So one company, you know, one company is cannot meaningfully <laughs> feed the needs of a, of, a, of a vast country. So I think that Sid's example is really a, a, a blueprint for what has to be done over and over and over and over again. For all of these diseases, whether cancer or genetic or common, you need new technology solutions that from day one, you build for one reason, to be affordable and scalable. And then the insurance companies will have no choice, right? I mean, it's they can argue that they can't pay $2 million, but how can they argue that they're not going to pay $20,000? i am really glad you brought this up, Richard. I would Manuel. like to give the last question to Eskadar Kifle Lama of Ethiopia. Yeah. I think it's a very important question. Eskadar. Yeah. Hi. So, please. Hi. My name is Eskadar. I'm from Ethiopia. And... Um, uh, just to tell you a little background on why I'm interested in this, uh, my sister recently uh, found out that she has a genetic mutation that causes um, uh, paraganglioma sarcoma. It's a type of uh, a rare cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, the she has the mutation of uh, the SDHB uh, gene mutation. Um, and then, uh, of course, when this happens, uh, 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 the fam all the family member needs to also do um, uh, gene testing just to see who has what. And then, uh, of course, I did that. Um, luckily, uh, at that time, I was in the U.S. and I was able to do the test for free. Um, and it turns out I also have that uh, gene mutation. Um, now, I I live in, in Ethiopia and... You know, it's a poor country. Um, um, getting access to regular health care uh, um, is hard, let alone, you know, like getting access to more advanced um, care. And and I'm just wondering, um, you know, um, can, can, uh, organizations like the WHO, what should be their um, role, um, uh, you know, to bring equitable health care? for poor countries um, or like uh, with helping in, uh, with introducing uh, new technologies um, um, like you speak of or, or even just allocating funds for research in rare diseases. Thank you. Oh, so first of all, my, my sincere sympathy. I, I, I work with families um, <clears throat> who are facing the challenge of uh, genetic uh, situations such as the one you describe. And I, it's my, my sympathy is not a theoretical one. This is where we're working to build solutions. We, I never give false hope, but I just want to let you know that what, what, the predicament you're describing that you and your family are in is, a, is not just dear to my heart emotionally, but also to us as a community in terms of building technologies. As mentioned, technologies are just the first thing. I'm really glad you brought up uh, an organization such as the WHO. But I mean, first of all, to be clear, 
you know, but we have tuberculosis, right? We have malaria, we have we have HIV, and you saw in the in the disease causes and mortality causes between countries of varying incomes. So I don't want to. I want to make sure that the WHO continues their impressive focus on on communicable diseases, which are devastating, especially in the developing world. To me, the single biggest contribution that an organization such as the WHO can play is being a bridge between developers of scalable nonprofit solutions to genetic disorders and the regulators, the economics ministries, and the communities on the ground, the healthcare providers on the ground, um, to see how we can match up a promising solution for a disease with the right infrastructure on the ground to try to pilot how we actually physically deploy this. Um, because, you know, in practical terms, again, I know I'm going over time, and Julie, I want to, I want to make, Manuel, I want to make sure I'll, I'll answer your question quickly. You know, in very practical terms, I want and passionate, all of us are, are passionate about having our solutions impact the planet. But for me, um, if you tell me, Dr. Ernov, you have a treatment for this genetic disease, what's the next step? Well, the next step is speak with clinicians at U University of California, San Francisco, or Children's Hospital in Seattle, or Se uh, Children's Boston. Uh, so institutions in the United States with which we have well-established interfaces where we can say we have a new therapy, can we talk about how we can do clinical trials? So better established interfaces to uh, healthcare providers, healthcare ministries, local authorities to help us channel or chaperone, if you will, our technology into the, into the part of the world where it's necessary it would be a really important thing. Again, my deep sympathy for your predicament. I know we're short on time. Manuela, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so we heard earlier from um, Stefano Rivella, and he suggested that one way to bring um, those treatments to countries like, um, you know, in countries in Africa and Southeast Asia uh, is to build the infrastructure there and, um, you know, make those treatment uh, there now how feasible that is um i would like to know from you and also is there also an issue uh, uh, around uh, knowledge transfer or patents and things like that as we saw for example with the COVID vaccines yep infrastructure absolutely yes um and again i think the example of immunio in india i think is is just a terrific example uh, I see a, a, a question from Santiago Nguyen from Vietnam. Um, I completely agree with your point. Um, the reason I bring this up is I've actually unfortunately not visited Vietnam, but I have visited Thailand, where the public health burden of thalassemia is formidable. And I was impressed with the fact that physicians at the Ramati Body Hospital at Mahidol University in Bangkok have built such a facility. You don't need a million such facilities. You need a relatively small number to make the sort of the medicine. But in tech transfer, I think, I mean, you really nailed it. We need mechanisms through which, again, not bypassing patents, but just understanding that the medical need is in the developing world. We need mechanisms whereby, and perhaps the WHO can play a role, nonprofit institutions, including the ones where I work, can be supported to tech transfer their know-how. You know, there's no need for a physician in the developing world to relearn CRISPR. There needs to be facility, like a turnkey facility, where you can build a CRISPR medicine, and there needs to be tech transfer of how you deploy it. Um, this has been done. There are very specific use cases, and I think we just need to multiply that over and over again. Um, Rachel, this I know we're out of time. This has been an absolutely riveting discussion. I would hope that the journalists uh, in our program understand the incredible opportunity that we've all received to hear from a researcher whose passion and whose uh, sort of leading edge perspective on the technology and innovation needed to 
increased rate of these equity is just so, so uh, pertinent and powerful. So Theodore Urnov of the University of California, Berkeley, thank you so much for taking time out to join the journalists in our program. And I hope, as so Camilla Sakamori just wrote, we need three hours with Theodore. Uh, well, <laughs> perhaps I, I, someday. I, please reach out. You have my email. I am, I've had, um, I really appreciate the work that you do. Thank you for paying attention to this whole overall narrative. And I'm very happy to make myself available to speak with you and discuss, just like I did with Camila, with Ruksha, with Julie, and with Manuela, sort of Eskadar country specific, but also globally relevant approaches to address this challenge. Thank I you. I think again. we need to do a Zoom uh, applause for Theodore Ornov. Right. Thank you so Thank you. much for your time. We will be in touch. Take care. Bye. Bye.